Crossroads Media. Not an ideal weekend. Holy shit. 0-2 against the Rangers and the most disgusting Penguins team I've ever seen. Jari sucks. The problem is Cal Peterson sucks even more. What a joke. Now you lose Jamie Drysdale. Travis Konechny wasn't available. Tyson Forster's battling injury. Now it's awesome that he's able to score with just barely any time left to maybe see if the Flyers could do something late. And he did return after taking one off the body. But at the end of the day, this team is beat the fuck up. And I have concerns because we know that they're not the most talented squad in the world. You need everything to be right. You need everything to be perfect for this to go the right way. And while I'm not afraid of the Devils because they constantly fail, I don't believe the Penguins can catch up. So there's plenty of horrible teams behind you. You're breaking down. You're potentially losing your number one defenseman. You're down your number one goal scorer. And can Scott Lawton keep up the shorthanded pace? Could that be the difference in you holding on? Is Scott Lawton scoring all of these goals? I don't know. I don't know. I think they still make the playoffs. I still think they're fine. But there's reasons to wonder if they can continue with the stretch that's about to hit the calendar when you flip the march because there's dangerous teams they're scary teams, and if this squad is is going to do it, well then you'll have to see some fantastic wins against some of these opponents, but man, what an emotional ride. Sunday alone was an emotional ride. 7-6. to six. Remember that playoff series where every game was 17-15? to 15? That's what it reminded me of when I saw that damn logo and I saw what was happening. All these shorthanded goals. It was so bad. It was so bad. And uh, originally, I went up against the game because I hosted 4-7pm, to 7 PM, so I was wasn't able to watch it in real time, but as soon as I got home, I settled in with the wife, with Brooklyn a little bit. When they went to bed, I rewatched the entire game, and it was gnarly. The power play makes me want to throw up. The penalty kill is ridiculous. Noah Cates with poise. He waits as he goes around the net, and then Scott Lawton's wide open. That was his second of the game. What what a weekend. I, I just can't get over it. DeLaurier and Rempe. Rempe ends up scoring a game-winning goal, six, eight and a half, standing in front of Erson. In what world did all of this happen over a two-day span? It's unbelievable. So we'll talk about it all. Before we do, though, we have more Broads Media content coming your way. Coffee with Broads is back starting March 28th, which is opening day. Join the Broads Media membership here on YouTube for $4.99 a month, and you will have access to Coffee with Broads live streams every Monday and Thursday at 11 a.m. It'll be laid back, super chill, very interactive with you and the chat. There's also a Broads Media Discord channel, too, that is currently active, where we will communicate live when games are going on, talking about all the action in real time. Nothing is changing with the current pods and the current model. It's just an added bonus if you want more Broads Media content in your life. I'm looking forward to starting the Coffee with Broads live streams again March 28th. And make sure if you're interested, you grab your membership today. The information is all down below in the description. So make sure you join the Broads Media family. All right, so let's start with the Rangers game that happened on Saturday. Remember, Black Friday, I have PTSD. You get bent over and annihilated. I can't have that, especially when you know Rangers fans are coming into your building, and it felt like it was 50-50. Honestly, it felt like I was watching a college football game when they do the... Uh, the 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 atmospheres that are half and half. What what's the what's the word I'm looking for here? Neutral sighting. It looked like a neutral sighting game where blue jerseys were everywhere, going nuts. I mean that's unacceptable, people. That's unacceptable. It's garbage. But I had to deal with it, and it sucked because they ended up losing. But they had so many opportunities. Travis Sanheim on a breakaway. Couturier backhand misses a wide 
open net, wide open net. And Shesterkin's always going to be annoying because he's a damn good net minder. But it was right there. You could have tied the game up, at least snagged a point. You deserved at least, at a minimum, two points this weekend. And you came out with zero, which stings heavily. You should have tied up that Rangers game. No doubt about it. It's just the truth. And unfortunately, it didn't happen. Now, Erson on Lafreniere made an excellent top 10 sports center type of save. And it's unfortunate that not shortly after, or very shortly after, not long after, there was a five-hole goal that I thought probably should have been stopped, but that came right after he made an excellent save. So does that even out? I guess so. Delorier tried to spark the boys, and hell of a fight, man. I'm not the biggest, hey, let's drop the mitts and bring it back to 1970s where we square up and dance anymore, but for Delorier to take on a 6-8 competitor and for it to go essentially a minute and 30 seconds, that was a warrior fight and you could feel the entire building rise. It had a purpose. That fight did work. It did do its job. You don't really see it like that anymore, although... You know, that kid on the Rangers who just got his NHL debut not too many games ago, he's doing it every night, and I think you probably have to tame that down because I just saw a highlight of him facing off against Columbus, and he got popped in the face a good amount of times. You can't just do it every night, man. You got to pick and choose your battles. I'm sure Lavi loves it, but you got to find a way at some point to find some balance there. How about Forster tying it up, though, when you're down one nothing? Scott Lawton, from the dead. I mean, Scott Lawton now is a very serviceable player. He's on a big-time point streak. And should this change what they do at the deadline? No, no. I know we keep hearing that Scott Lawton doesn't want to leave, so there's almost inspiration to play well. So the Flyers feel that they can't move on from the leadership and also the on-ice production. But I can make the argument that, if anything, this actually helps out the calls and other teams will now pick up the phone and wonder all right man maybe this is worth the first round draft pick he was hurting your team when he was on the ice for a good portion of the season now maybe you could also make the argument that that was never going to stay forever he's too good of a talent he's too special of a player that he won't suck and be a detriment to your roster for a long period of time and while his ceiling might not be insanely super intensely high yeah it's better than what we were getting for a good chunk of this season where I thought you could make the argument he could be scratched like he was that bad. Cam Atkinson territory and I thought Joel Faraby had a rough weekend too. Although some of the penalties I thought in that Rangers game what are we doing? He's standing in front of the net and just because Shesterkin can't get his stick you're going to put your stupid ass hand up with your damn orange stripe thinking you got all the power you joke. I'm not here to see you call any sort of fucking power plays you dope but here I am watching Faraby just live in his space. All right, the way Wayne Simmons territory, and because Shesterkin can't find his stick, I got to deal with uh, going to the box, whatever. Uh, fair, we didn't have a good weekend by any means, but I, I love what Scott Lawton's doing right now. It's helping out tremendously without some of your top dogs, and uh, it was a good effort against the Rangers. It just sucks that you weren't able to at least get a point, you know? Um Mm-mm-mm. Lawton hit the post shorthanded in that game as well as Noah Cates sort of slid in to that spot as Konechny's not in the lineup. And what are the odds that we're now dealing with a Travis Konechny injury because of something that went down in practice? It's never easy. It's never easy. This team is playing brutally banged up, even guys that are in the lineup. Yeah, Owen Tippett is skating around and available, but I don't know if he's super healthy. We know he's dinged up. Cam York is dinged up. A lot of these guys are working through a ton, and yeah, a lot of teams are probably dealing with very similar stuff at this time of the season. It's post-All-Star break. We're down that home stretch. The intensity picks up because people are fighting for their playoff lives, and they're either flirting around the wild card or they're trying to get in the top three spot in their respected division so it's a war zone out there and you know it's it's kind of what you have to deal with so you either buckle up and and find a way or you shrink and you get super tiny and the thing is I don't trust the devils like I don't think the devils are automatically going to flip the switch and be this outrageous team and by the way while that's happening the Flyers have to collapse insanely like the Philadelphia Eagles I don't think that's what is going to happen even though I'm I'm aware of what this Flyers team is, and they probably did do better to this point than what was expected of them. 
Their power play is so bad. It is unbelievable to think about what could be if they just had a below-average power play. A below-average power play. They just had a below-average power play. The shorthanded goals are ridiculous, though. And this isn't sustainable either. I don't know how they apply this much pressure when they're down a man. I don't know how they can't even make simple tape-to-tape passes, though, on the power play. How do you not? Can't get in the zone. The other team's sending it down all the way. It's crazy. It's crazy. All right, let's get into a debate that I saw around social media and a couple different platforms. And I actually stand by what the Flyers did. So you go with Erickson in game one against the Rangers with a back-to-back scenario you know you have to utilize Cal Peterson, who who sucks. I mean, Cal Peterson sucks. This was Cal Peterson. There's a reason why when you made a trade with the Kings, you had to take that money, take that contract. He's playing in the AHL. You cannot ever put him back in the crease again. He's that disastrous. He's that fucking pathetic. You can't play him. You cannot play Cal Peterson. Those goals were atrocious. I mean, you can't make that up or a short side consistently. He's getting beat. He's got no confidence at all. He stinks. He's not an NHL netminder, and that really hurt this team. They scored six goals and lost. When they were down 4-2, I thought it was over, and they tie it back up 4-4. Some good individual efforts, too. Sanheim with a clap bomb. That clap bomb was a rip. Lawton with two goals. I mean, that was tremendous. One of them being shorthanded. Forcer, his first goal when he was super close to the net, and he's able to dance around Jari like that and, and find the twine. That was electric. So there was a lot of great things when you really probably ruled them out. Cam York got on there. Now, Jari played just as bad. It was a battle of the worst goaltending I've ever seen. But how come the the Sidney Crosby-led Penguins were able to be the one to squeeze by? Right? Here's another five-point day. You know, Sidney Crosby sees a Flyers logo, and he's able to just accidentally walk into a 17-point performance. It makes no sense. This guy's one of the greatest I've ever seen. I, I don't know how to comprehend his greatness, but his greatness is so great. I'm in love with it. All right, I just have to be honest with you. I'm in love with it. But the debate was, getting back on point here, was should you have put Cal Peterson in against the Rangers because maybe you write that off as a loss anyway and you put your number one goalie in a position to win a game against the Penguins. But I hate that philosophy. What does that say to your team, right? It's almost like we're punting a game against the Rangers because we don't think we're good enough anyway or we're running away from a good test. This is a good playoff test to see how we sort of match up against a team like the Rangers. We know where they are in the standings. We look at the Metropolitan. We see their point total. They're on a nine-game win streak. They're going for a 10-game win streak. Let's go match up against them and try and kick their ass. Like, we have to bounce back from when we saw them on Black Friday. We're in our own building. We got to do something about it and I'd rather go down swinging with this truly or or at least if you wanted to and I know it's a very difficult position you also have to realize though that the workload wasn't very massive this week you played a game against the Chicago Blackhawks who stink on Wednesday and it's been pretty quiet since the stadium series so could you have went back to back with Harrison that's probably something that I'd be at least more willing to communicate about than the idea idea of let's punt the game against the Rangers. I despise that mentality. Like you're supposed to, if you are John Tortorella, building a culture of knowing what it's like to operate at this time in the season. Well, you see Toronto, you see Florida, you see Boston, you see Tampa, you see some of the, these teams coming up. We go do that every night. Ah, no Erson today. We're seeing the uh, the Boston. Bra- ah, you know what? We're seeing Tampa. Ah, we're seeing Florida. We can't play Erson tonight. Just wait until Chicago again. Or we'll wait until we see, I don't know, one of these bad teams. And then we'll throw Erson in because we don't really want to throw our good guys. Up. No, let's see what you got. Put your balls on the table. Let's go. And quite frankly, they should have at least went to overtime. Really. So, you know, I'm... I'm not going to rip them for that. They did it right. They put their best goalie in against the Rangers. You should think that you can maybe beat the Penguins with Cal Pearson so you actually have a chance of four points. 
fuck this whole, hey, we're living with just two, because that mentality would be, we're okay with just walking out with two. And I wouldn't crush them if they did walk out with two, but I don't want that to be the mentality prior to the weekend starting. I want them to go and say, we can win against the Rangers with our number one, and then we can beat the Penguins with Cal Peterson, who might allow four, but this Penguins team does not have firepower. They're not very good. They are not good. Kyle Dubis is in there. They're trying to make decisions. There are storylines left and right. Is Sidney Crosby going to finish out his career in Pittsburgh? Is it time to blow it up? I know they have contracts out there with Latang and this and that. L- listen, they stink. So realistically, prior to seeing the result, if Cal Peterson was once again just below average, you win that fucking hockey game. And you could have at least got a point out of the ring. could have three out of four points. I want to go in with that attitude, even if you swing and miss. If you strike out, if you're Kyle Schwarber, so be it. I'll live with it. I'll live with it. But what I can't live with is being a little bitch. And I think if you went with the alternative, you're being a little bitch. All right, let's go to HelloFresh and my friends over there because they are the greatest in the world. If you're not sure what HelloFresh is, oh, my God, it's America's number one meal kit, and they're the greatest in the world. So you can skip going to the grocery store nonstop every week. and No, no, no. It gets shipped right to your house. You go online, and you're able to select from over 40-plus recipes to choose from. And by the way, they're giving away free breakfast for life, okay? Free breakfast for life. Listen to this deal. Go to HelloFresh.com slash broads free and use code broads free for free breakfast for life one breakfast item per box while your subscription is active that's free breakfast for life at hellofresh.com slash broads free with code broads free so the way this thing works is you pick your ingredient uh, excuse me you pick your recipe and the ingredients get sent right to your doorstep and they're already pre-portioned so it comes in a bag and in the bag is all the ingredients with our step-by-step recipe card that shows you pictures, and it's about maybe seven, eight steps, pour X into skillet, pour Y into skillet. And you just cut the little bag that's already pre-portioned. You can't measure anything wrong. You can't put too much of this, too much of that. It gets executed with perfection. They make it so easy for you. And my wife and I have utilized it essentially every single night since joining the HelloFresh family. And same with my mother, same with my stepdad. Same with my father, same with my brother, same with my aunt. I mean, I tell you, my whole entire family now is obsessed with HelloFresh, and you will too. The moment you try it, I promise you're not going back to anything else. Let's go down below in the description right now if you're listening and go to HelloFresh.com slash free for your free breakfast for life and your opportunity to have world-changing meals every single night. Uh, Probably one of the biggest takeaways from this weekend is Jamie Drysdale. It doesn't look good. It does not look good. It does not look good. The hit itself, I have no issue with the hit itself. He did put himself in a vulnerable position there. If you watch the replay in the slow-mo from behind, I don't know if he toe picks, but he loses an edge or loses his balance a little bit there for a half a second, and I think that even put him in more of a vulnerable position if I saw it correctly, and it's just a shame. It's unfortunate, and he obviously had a shoulder injury before in the past when he was with Anaheim, and... I'm not going to speculate and say that it's the same thing, but it doesn't look good. That reaction is more than a, hey, we'll have him back here soon. And this is your number one demon. It's your number one demon. This is massive. And, you know, I I know people get worried that maybe it can constantly happen and the same shoulder will be maybe an issue every single year. Every time we talk about the Flyers at some point, a Jamie Drysdale injury. Sort of like what we were talking about with Sean Couturier for a while. It's always the back. He's got it back here. He's got this. He's got that. He's got this again. He's got this again. It's like, all right, what are we doing here, you know? And then now Coots is on and off, but he's still able to to be a very effective Sean Couturier, obviously. I don't know. I I, I don't know. If, if, if this happens again and now it's three times, then yeah, okay, then maybe I'd be more willing. But I don't know if it's just something. He's so young. He's so young. He's barely in his 20s. He's got a long career ahead of him if he's able to stay healthy. Just very unfortunate. It sucks for this run. It really does. It sucks for this run. And and I know that there's a lot of fans out there that isn't really projecting anything in a playoff run anyway. So maybe it doesn't hurt them as much as it hurts me. 
Um, I've just watched a lot of hockey my whole life, my whole entire life. I'm 28 years old. So for almost 30, I remember being one watching hockey, damn it. So I've been watching my whole life, all right? And I remember being one years old saying, Daddy, you could be an eighth seed and get in and win the cup. And he goes, you're right, bro. You're the smartest baby I've ever had. And I said, thank you. Well, you've only had two because I'm the second, but thank you. And that's really how my first conversation went as a human. Anything can happen. Anything can happen. Now, it doesn't mean the statistics are very high in your favor. Anything can happen in the NHL playoffs. This hurts me. This crushes me. Mark Stahl. Now you have to wonder about the Walker-Sealer thing. Does this change what they want to do because they don't want to send a message to the locker room that we're getting rid of a, a pair of defensemen when you're out Jamie Drysdale and they feel obligated to at least let them know, like, hey, we, we, we do appreciate what you've been doing here. We're not just going to blow everything up, but you, you might. You might have to at the deadline here at the end of the first week of March. You might have to. Was it March 8th? which is, what, a Friday, I believe? Yeah, not this week, the following week. So two more weeks, you know, and then maybe you move law. In. You got to get a different goalie in here, though. F- Felix Sandstrom doesn't seem to be popping off in the minors by any means. You hear some potential stuff about the Russian goalies, their season's ending, them coming over, but that's a lot of expectation to put on them as well. Uh, I-, I don't think they're going to move off of what they've been pretty open about since the beginning of their tenure. They're not going to create any shortcuts. They're going to do this the same way no matter how this season goes. And maybe this makes it easier for them. Maybe this makes it an easier... Look, you know, guys are getting injured. We got to maximize our return. It just is what it is. Compared to if they're just playing lights out, elite, unbelievable hockey, they feel obligated to... To, to not blow it up. I don't know. I mean, I'm just try- trying to honestly talk out loud right now and see what this Jamie Drysdale injury and TK injury could mean to a potential deadline move. But at the end of the day, I don't think any of this is going to sway Briere and Jonesy because they do seem to have their brains screwed on tight and they are not going to falter. They are not going to move. They are not going to change. They believe in their ideas. They believe in their beliefs. And they're going to go down with it. And that's good. That's good. That's good. That's good. But this Jamie Drysdale injury looks looks brutal. I wouldn't be surprised if we don't even see Jamie Drysdale again. That's how bad I think this injury could be. And, and then if you think about it, if it lingers into offseason and it lingers into offseason training and getting in the weight room and, and that whole thing, that changes what he could be next year. It, it sucks. It just sucks so much. It's a part of the game, unfortunately. I got no problem with the hit whatsoever. It just sucks. It's one of those very unfortunate events that we now have to wait for an update and wait to see what happens. But what a miserable, weird, awkward, insane weekend. I, I feel what happened over the 48 hours could have been really a three-week span of emotions. I I truly feel that way. All right, what we're going to do now is run to the Anytime Hotline and get some thoughts on this weekend. I'm going to start off with the call from Saturday's game, and then I believe the rest is all after Sunday. So let's do it. Hey, bros, calling in. Uh, Flyers just tied at uh, 1-1 in third. So a lot of hockey left in this game and a lot of hockey obviously left this weekend with the game tomorrow. Um, I don't think the Flyers should get rid of Scott Lawton. I think they need to move their focus to getting rid of Joel Farabee. The dude has been awful. This game has been awful. He doesn't produce much. He turns over the puck. He takes terrible penalties. The, the, The official's getting in his face telling him to shut the hell up. He's he's not good. Young bees are in the cut needs to be out, and I think that's who. If they need to shop somebody, it's him. All right, let me know what you think. I disagree. That's what I think. I disagree. Joel Farabee did not have a good weekend, but to say we got to get rid of Joel Farabee, Joel Farabee is a part of this future. Joel Farabee is 24 years old, 24 years old. And I I understand that it feels like he's been here for a while because he did make his NHL debut at 19 years old playing 52 games. But he's on pace to score 
uh, more than he's ever scored in his career. Now, keep in mind, when he did log in 20 goals his second season, he only played 55 games, so he was on trajectory to light the lamp more. But he's sitting at 17 goals right now in 59 games. He might hit that 23 mark, 24. I mean, you have a 20-plus goal scorer at 24 years old. That's, that's a damn good position to be in. I mean, that's a damn, damn good position to be in. I like Joel Farabee a lot. I think he's got a lot of speed. Remember, he was dealing with some injury stuff and some weirdness involved with that injury stuff over the last couple of years. Well, what was that, two years ago now, I, I believe? Was that two years ago now? Maybe my timelines are getting mixed up. But by no means do we need to make a knee-jerk reaction and start calling for Joel Farabee. We have a vision here, right? And part of the vision is Owen Tippett, Travis Konechny, Joel Farabee, Couturier's contract keeps him here, Cam York, Jamie Drysdale. This is it. This is the core that you're growing with. So even if someone who's been in the league now for almost five years and playing for a while, it's it's still a learning curve and still getting back to where he once was after the injury and, and figuring out how to how to be what he's going to be in this league under torch with this new fresh system and idea and, and rebuilding. You got to find your identity within this mix is sort of what I'm trying to get at here. And while there's been some downs for Joel Farabee and this wasn't the greatest weekend at all to defend who he is, trading Joel Faraby is a whole nother level of discussion, which is ludicrous, especially if we're now debating Scott Lawton or Joel Faraby. I mean, Scott Lawton, we're talking about Faraby having a downtime, and he blows statistically Scott Lawton out of the water. And this is a downtime for Faraby. Scott Lawton's got nine goals. Nine goals, consistently 11 goals, 12 goals, 13 goals. He did have 18 a few years back. I don't think he's two years ago an 18-goal scorer. I think he's probably more 11. I think Scott Lawton's more of 12. I think that's sort of where he lives when he's playing Scott Lawton hockey. Probably sits around that 12 to 14 mark. And and, and Joel Farabee's downness is sitting at 17 right now, sniffing 20 goals. So, nah, I, I, I'm, I'm out on the let's trade Joel Farabee thing. I believe that that's probably a little too aggressive. Let's go to Sean. Let's do it. Uh, another tough one today, but, I mean, it's tough to win a game basically playing with an empty net for three periods because that's what the Flyers had to face. Cal Peterson was absolute trash. Uh, I mean, he himself cost the Flyers at least one point today. Yeah. You make a save. You make the routine save routinely, and the Flyers walk out of there with a victory today, despite everything that Crosby did. You know, tough day again, Drysdale, surprise, surprise, hurt again. The losing streak will continue Tuesday night because we're not beating the Lightning. So the Flyers now are facing adversity. They're up against it. I, I thought they played well enough to at least garner one point this weekend to come away with nothing and then have injuries on top of it, that's truly insult to injury. Well, let's not just roll out a victory on Tuesday against the Lightning. I can't roll out victory. Look, as, as bad as the weekend was, the Flyers do win good games. The Flyers do beat good teams. Let's see what happens. You're at home. I know the lightning scares everybody. I know, I know, I know. I don't live underneath of a rock. But they're going to beat some of these good opponents. They're going to. Whether we agree with how they've been winning games or not or how good are they, reality is the record speaks for themselves. The only thing that's holding me back would be these injuries. I mean, these injuries could really snowball Tyson Forster isn't 100%. He gets so many damn scoring chances. Sometimes it blows my mind. Wide open in the slot, cranks one, misses the net, or this and that. I'm like, oh, man, dude. He could probably have four goals every night. He ends up with one, and he should be getting four. And here I am complaining about that. But, yeah, I feel like Tyson Forster is around the net so much. And I remember saying the same thing, actually, about Owen Tippett. When Chuck Fletcher made the trade originally and he first got here from Florida, he was hitting posts. He's wide. I'm like, dude, can this guy bury? I mean, what the hell? He's always there. He's in the right spots. He's got a hell of a shot. It's this, it's that. But he's not producing. And then now he's one of my favorite players on the Flyers. So I eventually believe that Forster will get there. And by the way, I mean, Tyson Forster plays a lot. He plays a lot. He logs in a lot of time. 
Young kid, young kid. Torts has given him a nice leash, and I've been enjoying that, no doubt. Okay? Zach, you're up next. What's up, bros? Just calling in late here about the flyer game. I wasn't able to watch it, but hell, this guy Peterson fucking blows. <laughs> I mean, I know people aren't crazy about Airson, but God, we need him because if it's Peterson, you're you're getting blown out every fucking game. And this one was actually close. You you know, you think you get six goals, you're gonna fucking win. But uh or set whatever it was, six or seven. But I know Harrison, you know, when he's on, it's going well. And, and he's a great goal, goalkeeper when he's on. When he's off, it's tough, you know. But you kind of have to live with that if this is the alternative. Um, and, unfortunately, we're put in this position with this whole Carter Hart situation that I don't even want to talk about because that's a fucking mess. But, uh, yeah, man, we just got to hope Harrison can, you know, lace up the jock strap and fucking come to work and ball out because if not, we're going we're gonna to give up five goals a night, you know? Yeah, and they don't have enough firepower to consistently counter that with six or seven goals because on most nights you're not facing Jari who's off. So when Jari's off as bad as it is, it opens up the door, but that's not common here. Yeah, I mean, Erson, I think, has to play more, unfortunately for him. He's getting thrown into the fire big time. And, um, you know, look, if I'm a player and <laughs> – Maybe I'm a little biased because I struggled to get opportunities by the end of my career, and I wanted them badly, and I was desperate for it. And I really wanted to show my worth. So knowing that if I was given too much time, I would have taken that in a heartbeat because I know what it's like to be a healthy scratch. I know what it's like to be a seventh or eighth defenseman trying to crack the lineup. And I'm watching Urson right now getting asked to play two games in a row, two weekend games against big division rivals and this and that. And it's like, hey, you're putting him in a tough spot, but I know from a competitive athlete standpoint, I wish I was put in a tough spot to try and prove my worth because, you know, sitting there on the bench, if that's him opening up the door watching Urson, you're hungry and you want to get out there big, or, well, that is Urson, I'm sorry. If he was, if Urson was on the bench and he was watching somebody out like Carter Hart before everything happened, yeah, hungry to get out there and wanting to get out there. And that, that was a strength. Like, this was a real legitimate strength of the hockey team for a while until, well, you know, the Carter Hart news happened and now you're in a big time pickle so we can't play every game as much as I would love for that to happen it would be outrageous to do that so you have to find something because Cal Peterson's not in maybe the answer is you give Sandstrom a shot and he might not end up being good enough and he probably won't be good enough and then from there you got to figure something out um yeah I know we talk about maybe not adding anything at the deadline this or that but uh, how much would it cost you to maybe get a serviceable backup goalie in here and I don't think I'd crush you if it was a very low price just to help hold down the fort a little bit because you do owe it to your team a tad. Like, that that wouldn't be ruining the future. You know what I'm saying? That would be ruining and blowing up a huge rebuild to, to tweak when necessary. And I believe that would be tweaking when necessary. I do. All right, everybody, those are my thoughts on this Flyers weekend. Crazy one. That's for damn sure. Let me know your thoughts. I appreciate you all, and we'll be talking very, very soon.